Hello, I'm Delaney Rustin, physician and the creator of the three Screenagers movies, and this is the Screenagers podcast. Kids, especially teens, don't like being told what to do. As parents and trusted adults in their lives, often we find ourselves doing just that, telling them what to do, hoping to get them to do some particular thing. And how well does that go? Often not so well. Of course, we want them on their own to make healthy choices. It turns out there's a whole art and science of how we can better communicate with our kids around the choices they are confronted with in their lives, be it what they decide to buy at a convenience store, junk food versus healthy food, if you can even find much healthy food in these convenience stores, Be it what they decide to watch on YouTube, for example, or what they decide to do when a peer offers them an e-cigarette to try for the first time. One communication tool has to do with raising awareness in youth about how they're being a pawn in someone else's game, how certain industries, without kids' best interests in mind, are out to make a profit off kids' decisions. To understand all of this more, I'm talking with a wonderful researcher today, David Yeager. David holds a PhD in psychology and is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. He trained under Carol Dweck, who's the eminent researcher of the whole field of mindsets. David has done highly regarded research in the field of mindsets and motivation, all with the intention of developing tools that help people, particularly young people, to make wiser decisions in their lives. It's exciting that he has a book coming out this summer titled 10 to 25, The Science of Motivating Young People, a groundbreaking approach to leading the next generation and making your own life easier. Today, we look at experiments having to do with youth's ideas and choices around junk food and social media via giving them certain information. The results are really astounding, and it gives us insight into the power of having these periodic conversations in this area. And today in this episode, I'm excited to share sections of the most recent Screenagers film titled Screenagers Under the Influence. And I'm going to start the show with it and end the show with scenes from the film. Screenagers Under the Influence addresses vaping, alcohol, and drugs, and how the digital age impacts teens' decisions around these substances. The film also addresses the addictive potential of video gaming and screen time. Let's go ahead and start. This section in the film is one that teen audiences tell me how much they find this fascinating and, frankly, infuriating. It has to do with vaping, and the company Juul, an e-cigarette company, used deceptive marketing practices to really entice young people to start using their vapes. This started some years ago, and in these clips I'm about to share, you hear Stanford physician Dr. Robert Jackler, who's an expert on marketing practices of tobacco companies, talk about what Juul did. 90% of smokers start before the age of 18. There are very few 40-year-olds that say, hey, I think I'm going to start smoking. Well, the industry knows that. And they want to recruit new people to smoke, and they'd like them to smoke for a long period of time. So they go after teenagers. I began to collect the advertisements, and pretty soon I'd had tens of thousands, and eventually we have a collection of about 60,000 original tobacco ads. And when I looked at what they did in the 1920s through 1950s, and I look what e-cigarette companies are doing now, I realized, oh my gosh, they're doing the same thing today. As was said in an internal tobacco industry document, Get them young, train them right, and then we'll have them for customers for the rest of their life. And that was the philosophy, and they still do that today. They would pay influencers, and they use organic social media, where the teenagers become members of their marketing crew by saying how much they like it. The reach of that organic social media, those posts, can go out to millions of people. It's like lighting a match to begin a fire. Later in this section of the film, Dr. Jackler talks about a congressional hearing that happened in 2019 in which Congress was investigating Juul and how their ads and social media efforts were targeting youth. Dr. Jackler spoke at the hearings, 
In this film clip, we hear what one of the Jewel founders, James Monsies, says in the congressional hearing. We never wanted any non-nicotine user, and certainly nobody underage, to ever use Jewel products. Dr. Jackler explains why he didn't believe Monsi's statement for a second. Early on in his journey to create e-cigarettes, he had come to me to talk about tobacco advertising, to learn about tobacco advertising. He used our advertising database for research, and he told me that. He said, you know, the advertising database you have that you created at Stanford of all these tobacco ads was really helpful to us when we planned how to market Juul. Monsies was asked about his visit to see Jackler's ad collection. We were very interested in using his resource to understand exactly what, act what bad actions those tobacco companies have taken to familiarize ourselves with how not to run a business. And here is Dr. Jackler again. I just laughed when I saw that because it was so ridiculous because they copied the big tobacco marketing techniques very faithfully. The young people looking super cool. Consistently, teens who see these scenes in the film tell me how angry it makes them feel. And I believe that learning how Juul and other e-cigarette companies are working to get young people hooked on nicotine it seeps into their consciousness and helps them hopefully make wiser choices. But I wanted to dig deeper into the science of this. And so now let's turn to researcher David Yeager. David, let's start with your experiments that have to do with the fact that youth are being manipulated by the processed food industry. I'll call it the junk food industry. And your work to see how you can help kids make better choices when it comes to food. The Healthy Eater study was one of the best experiments I've ever been a part of. In our research, we ran a study where we wanted to influence the healthy choices that young people made in the lunch. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we tried to apply the model of adolescence as a, a period of strength and resilience in a setting where basically nothing works. And that setting is promoting healthy eating habits. We observed at some point that the average effect of anti-obesity programs was to cause teenagers to gain weight, which means the programs backfired. And so why did they backfire? Well, because most of the programs lecture teenagers, say, here's what you have to eat, do what I say, I'm a grown up, I know the right choice and you need to listen to me. But they don't address the core issue, which is that two key values for adolescents are a concern with social justice and a desire for autonomy. Being the kind of person in the seventh grade lunchroom who goes and only eats a salad or only eats a fruit cup makes you look like the kind of person who does what your parents say all the time. And that's the last thing you want to be doing publicly in the fishbowl of the middle school lunchroom. And so we wanted to say, is there a way to make healthier eating actually high status? Something that is admirable for young people. Yeah. We ran an experiment to test a better way to influence teens' healthy choices. Here's how the study worked. We devised an expose of the manipulative marketing food practices of the food companies. And the way we did that was by looking at this interesting set of stories about what the food companies are doing to make the opposite of healthy food, junk food, very addictive and really prominent. I know that in the study, one group of students were told lots of ways that food companies create products to be as addictive as possible. Um, can you speak about what those students learned? Yeah, we created an expose of the manipulative marketing practices of the food companies. So you may not know this, but there's a reason why hot Cheetos are very addictive. And the reason why is because the food companies paid lots of scientists to run laboratory experiments with all possible combinations of cheesiness, meltiness, and spiciness, so that when you place the Cheeto on your tongue, it melts quickly enough to prevent your brain's natural satiety mechanisms from realizing that you've eaten any food. Mm -hmm. But then the cheesiness deposits a layer of cheesiness on your tongue that also has a layer of spiciness that causes you to salivate even more and crave the food. And so it's not an accident that this happened because they optimized it. They did experiments and said, what's going to make a 12-year-old keep going to the, the bag of hot Cheetos? On top of that, they invented a cartoon character 
that was very appealing to young children. And then they marketed it on the airwaves during children's cartoons in order to get kids before they were old enough to make their healthy habits totally hooked and addicted to the junk food. Furthermore, they did this especially in poor communities, communities where there's less access to fruits and vegetables because of how the, they signed the contracts with the corner stores. Also, I know you brought up the fact that people who run the food companies often come from other industries. Can you speak to that? So you have food executives who, by the way, used to work at the tobacco companies before they were hired by the food companies, mm -hmm. engaging in these practices and laughing all the way to the bank. So this is all true. We just told teenagers this. And we said, by the way, anytime you are buying Coke or Cheetos or other highly processed sugary foods, you are giving money to these people who think you don't know any better and who think you'll never stand up for yourself or for other people in need. So our goal in that is both to tell the truth and to make it clear that eating healthy in the lunchroom is not what lame nerds do to listen to their parents. It's what rebellious, autonomous young people do in order to stick it to the man. I know this was a very big study, David. Can you just talk about that and clarify what the experimental group was and the control group? We took eighth graders in a school district and had them learn this information I just told you through a short online reading and writing exercise where they wrote an essay at the end explaining the content to others who might be interested in it. Mm -hmm. For in a control group, they got information from health class. So they saw pictures of the food pyramid and they learned about how calories work and they read quotes from nutrition experts. So classic ways that adults try to change teenagers' behavior that we know don't work. David and his team did something else in the study that was quite clever. We don't just tell kids this information. We had the kids see real advertisements that had been created by Coca-Cola, Cheetos, Sprite, and so on. And these were ads that were part of this manipulative marketing campaign that the companies had used. And so we asked the teenagers to take things that felt deceptive to them and make them true. David gave tablets, like iPads, to kids. And using software, the kids could write on the ads. They were told to counter whatever the ad was claiming. They called it the make it true activity. So the eighth graders came up with very funny ways of burning the food companies. There's a McDonald's advertisement that says what you want whenever you order a salad, and it shows a hamburger. So they rewrote it to say, what you want when you order a salad should be a salad. So with all this work, what did David and his team discover? What did they find in the students who were taught about junk food in a whole new way compared to students who got usual lessons about food not being healthy, the food pyramid and such? We partnered with the school district to track what kids bought in the lunchroom over the next three months. And so by linking their purchases to their ID cards, we found that there was a 30% reduction in the amount of junk food that students bought in the lunchroom. The, the, the magnitude of that finding is striking. In fact, it's uh, almost half of what, of a reduction in calories that would be needed in order to stop and possibly even reverse the entire trend of the current obesity epidemic. This is such a significant drop in the amount of junk food bought by students. Also, David's team found lasting changes for three months, they tracked the cafeteria food choices of the students. And for all of that time that they tracked it, the experimental group chose significantly healthier foods than the students who got the standard food pyramid type of lessons. But David, what about the fact that youth are exposed to so much ads, influencers, all sorts of things happening on social media? It's just saturated with ads and yeah. product placements. You have reels, TikToks, all sorts of media about junk food. There are Snapchat, Instagram, Google Maps that they're just popping up with ads about food chains right near you. It's just amazing how much we forget how many ads young people are being fed all the time. We did worry that the company's food advertisements would overtake 
the benefits from our treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's why we had teenagers do graffiti on the food ads with the Make It True activity. So we turned the entire world around them into a booster for the effects of the treatment. And it just goes to show that we underestimate the power of teenagers to actually improve the world. A lot of people think teenagers are like in one ear, out the other, but that's not what we think. If you change what someone believes about a company, that sticks with them. You don't really need to be reminded of that, especially if it's egregious or hypocritical or harmful. I love what David is saying here, and I can't agree more. Tapping into teens' sense of social justice is so powerful. Teens care, and they don't want to be taken advantage of. Now, here's the question. What about the ways that teens think about social media companies and the ways that these companies design their platforms to be as enticing and as reinforcing as possible? How they work to hook all of our attentions, including teens, of course. And they do this to sell as many ads as possible and to collect data and sell data and all of that as well. So how does this knowledge, this mindset of these companies impact teens' views about and use of social media? Researcher Brian Gala and his group designed experiments to look at just that very question. Here, David Yeager talks about Brian Gala's research findings. Yeah, so some new research is really promising. It's applying this idea of values alignment, of aligning healthy behavior with values like autonomy and concern for social justice Mm -hmm. uh, to the social media context. So in a way that's very similar to the tobacco companies marketing to children and the food companies making hot Cheetos addictive to children, the social media companies have also marketed their products to children and made them have this kind of neural reward that is very addictive. And so an unpromising study led by Brian Gala, they've looked at whether you can make the same kind of argument about the social media companies. Brian Gala and his colleagues ran an experiment where there were two groups. In one group, they got an expose about the practices of the social media companies that cause young people to continue to want to revisit and scroll through every day, to grab their eyeballs for attention, to make money. In another group, they got neutral content that was not informing young people of social media. And then they compare the social media use of those two groups over time. What types of things were students told about the way social media platforms are designed? It's designed to make you feel like it's never enough. For sure. You don't measure up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that you're going to miss out on your whole social life if you're not constantly checking it. And that's exploiting everything that that we've learned about the adolescent brain and how it processes reward and so on. And so those design principles cause the applications to be addictive. And when you tell teenagers about that, they say, you know what, that actually seems right to me. And they really respond negatively. They say, this is not how I want to spend my time. This is not who I want to be. What were the findings? After young people had, had read the expose about the social media company's practices, they were more motivated to put down their social media and to use it less. And three months later, they had different attitudes about social media and they were more aware of these manipulative practices in the applications. The insight David shares here is profound. By adjusting the messaging and building on the strengths that adolescents already have, we see vastly different results in the effectiveness of these health campaigns. David Yeager is in Screenagers Under the Influence, and I want to share another section of the film in which teen audiences tell me how impactful it is for them to see it. In this scene, David is talking about anti-smoking campaigns that didn't work, and then ones that worked. And it worked because it harnessed all the things we've been talking about in this podcast. The first anti-smoking advertisements said things like, think, don't smoke. Think, don't smoke. That's like a bunch of grown-ups telling you you're not thinking, which is insulting. Second of all, telling you what to do. Those tobacco advertisements were running across the airwaves. Turns out that they were causing harm. They were making teenagers want to try smoking more. The tooth campaign was very clever. They didn't tell you what to do. What they said was, there's a reason why people are addicted to smoking. It's because the tobacco companies made it addictive. 
And there's a reason why kids are smoking. It's because they market it to children. And so they depict thousands of kids outside a high-rise building and telling tobacco executives in the building to take a day off from killing. So it portrays the young people as standing up against that injustice, making non-smoking the high-status thing to be doing. Researchers found that in its first four years, this campaign prevented an estimated 450,000 teens from smoking. Clearly, there's many benefits of teens knowing about the various ways industries work to get their business. Engaging our kids or our students in periodic conversations about marketing, messaging, manipulation is just important, really important in helping them sorting out all the decisions they have to make in their life. Rather than our telling them the ways they're being manipulated, I think it's crucial that we ask questions. What things are they seeing? Help them to be critical thinkers about all the forces at play. All the money being made by tech companies to keep them and all of us on social media. Other platforms that also benefit by selling ads such as YouTube, Discord, video games where ads pop in all the time, these free games. Again, you're paying with your attention. Having conversations about the nicotine industry, the cannabis industry, alcohol industry, junk food industry, the fast fashion industry. There's just lots of ways that these companies try to tap into subconscious and conscious desires to fit in, to get quick fixes, to tap into our desire for immediate gratification, be it sugar or be it Cheetos. Thanks for listening today. And please follow the Screenagers podcast, which is the same thing as subscribing. And rate and review it if you have a minute. This really helps spread the word. We have show notes at screenagersmovie.com, where you can also learn about our three Screenagers movies, sign up for my weekly blog about parenting, and search topics of hundreds of past blogs. Meanwhile, we'd love to hear your ideas for future podcast episodes. Email me at Delaney at ScreenagersMovie.com. This Screenagers podcast episode was produced by me, your host, Delaney Rustin, Lisa Tab, Rebecca Tolan, and our sound editor was Alan Gofinski. 